So the text for this morning comes from Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at verse 22 up to verse 30 in a moment. So we're going to begin uh, in a few weeks a whole new series entitled The Kingdom of God. Um, next two Sundays we're still looking at some of the women in the Bible. But the purpose of this morning is to introduce the series uh, about the Kingdom of God. And um, when we looked at that series we understood how big the subject is and my task this morning is to encompass it all in half an hour. So. Keep praying. <laughs> and the problem we've got with the kingdom of God is that we don't understand the king um, and the concept of a king. Recently, we've, uh, we've been at home, we've been looking at a series on Charles I, and I'm just doing some background reading. And some of his troubles began when he tried to impose upon the Scottish Episcopalian Church uh, a new prayer book, and the Scots didn't want that. And so instead of entering into discussion, they raised an army. <laughs> As you do when you're not happy with something, they raised an army. So King Charles raised an army, and uh, he had to. King Charles had to retreat because the Scots came to, to Berwick, and he retreated. I thought, I'm not going to take that on. The year later, he thought, I'm not having this. So he raised another army, and went to confront the Scots over this prayer book. They raised their army. This time, they got to Newcastle, <laughs> and he had to retreat. Those two armies had robbed his treasury. And so he had to go to Parliament to ask for, for more money. And Parliament said, we'll give you some more money if you agree to these terms. And they began to limit the king's power. And in this country, the, the uh, and it's very relevant today, isn't it? The, the uh, relationship between monarch and Parliament and we really don't have the concept of an absolute king who can do absolutely what he likes. Uh, it really is rule by consent. <clears throat> when we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about the dynamic, universal rule of God who rules without anybody else's permission. And it's what the Bible says, that he does everything in conformity with his own will. He works things out there. And for the people of Israel, it was even more uh, a, a bigger concept than the local people, like the Canaanite uh, regions around, where people had their own God of their land. And then for the God of Israel to be known as the God who has absolute power, not only just his people, but the whole world. So when we're looking at the Kingdom of God, I hope we'll be contemplating some of the questions that do arise in the complexity of uh, our present situation. So who is in charge? That's the question. Who's in charge of the, the, the natural, the physical world? And all the debate about the Amazon forest burning and pollution and climate change. Who actually owns and runs that world? Who's in charge of governments? Is a government only there because the people say so? And God is just an absent fatherly figure who can't get involved in that. What about our own nation? The destiny of our nation. Do the nations belong to God? Does he determine their course? The economics. In our own life, how are the bills going to be paid? And do we have... A, a king in our life who is actually committed to supplying the things that we need. Church, and we're talking, um, and um, within Wisbech, we're talking about churches working together. Um, some churches, and some church leaders are saying, the church is on the point of death. It will soon be extinguished. Is that possible? Is Jesus in charge of the church? Yeah. <laughs> You know, or is it, oh, just people have given up faith, so it's all going to disappear. So, we're, the kingdom of God looks at these sort of issues. And we're going to take Matthew 12 as a starting point. Let me read it. 
They brought him a demon, uh, to, they brought Jesus, a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. And the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house? and carry off his possessions, unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. So this introduction is a bit like when you go to the supermarket and there's a new product, or you go to the deli counter and there's some cheeses they want to do, and there's the free samples, you know, and you can have one. And, and, uh, so we're giving you a, a, a little sample, a little taste of what the, the series is about. Um, it won't satisfy your appetite, let me tell you that. It might raise some questions and uh, I'll say some things, you say, well, how does all that work in? We've got months that we're going to be looking at the kingdom of God. But this is the, the taster. If you don't come back to the counter, I think, oh, well, okay. <laughs> but I hope to, to tease you in this. We're going to do three things. We're going to look at the story very briefly. We're going to look at the immediate teaching that Jesus draws out. And then we're going to learn, see what we can learn about the kingdom of God from this account. And just uh, as you are listening to the preachers as we go through this series, just to, for you to know that all the preachers who are engaging in this are under strict discipline. So we're checking each other because we feel this is so important. And um, we want your response, but certainly as those who are engaged in the preaching, we're, 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 we're supporting and monitoring one each other so that we're really delivering what God uh, has laid on our hearts. So the story, very quickly. So in the context, uh, the Pharisees are uh, trying to find uh, problems with Jesus, chapter 12, verse 2. Uh, they, they saw Jesus, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Then later on, uh, Jesus says to them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? There's a whole issue going on here. Jesus, in their eyes, is breaking the law, God's law. Um, he's a rebellious person. And Jesus challenges that. So they're questioning his authority. And in the congregation, verse 13, he says to the man with the withered hand, just stretch it out. Right there. In the okay. <laughs> Let, let's just get on with it. And then they look for a way to kill him. Verse 15 says, Jesus withdraws to a solitary place. He goes, goes to a place that people follow him. And it's interesting that Matthew says that this is to fulfill what the prophet says. He, he will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. He's not going to organize a street march, a protest, a riot, put up the barricades. I'm just going to get on with the job. And that's what happens when, verse 22, they brought him a demon-possessed man. Now, he's aware of the controversy that this could cause, but I'm here to do a job, and I'm just going to get on with it. I'm not going to cause a riot. I'm not going to shout and argue and debate with you. I'm just going to get on with it. Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see, and the people were astonished. Now this morning, we're not dealing on that healing, and that's a temptation for the preachers going through this. We look at it and say, oh, let's talk about Jesus re releasing people from dumbness and blindness, uh, the power of the kingdom, but we're not talking about that. We're looking at the after effect, what happened. Because when the people were astonished, they said, could this be the son of David? So there's two reactions that come out of this. The first is from the people. The, the, they are absolutely astonished at what Jesus has done. Because he's got a reputation, he's healing people, and, and then right before their very eyes, he was blind, he was dumb, and he can do both. I remember, uh, I haven't witnessed many miracles of that order, but I do remember being at a conference in Birmingham once, and uh, uh, 
a person in a wheelchair, and people say, oh, it was set up, this wasn't set up. <coughs> person in a wheelchair got up and walked across the stage out of that wheelchair. We have a friend, it's, a, it's an old story, but went to Africa, and uh, there was a child born with no eyes, and they prayed, and the child had eyes, and he was a doctor. I say, how, how does this happen? This astonishment of what he's done. And so they conclude that sort of authority, that sort of power, must belong to the Son of David, which, take my word for it, is another way of saying the Messiah, the Christ. This must be the Christ, the one we've been waiting for. The person who's bringing in this golden age of God's blessing and prosperity and freedom, liberation, the favour of God. He's actually come. This man must be the Son of God. The Pharisees think differently. They've heard about it. And they're guardians of the tradition. They're strict observers of the law. Uh, their, their statements carry a lot of weight. So they come down from Jerusalem to check out Jesus and give a ruling on him. Now the Pharisees, um, some, it says in verse 27 that some of their flock do <laughs> cast out demons. So it's not an unknown thing. There was also a lot of sorcery. We, we read in Acts about Simon the sorcerer. So there were people who could practice the dark arts, the magic arts. And um, the Pharisees can't deny that something has happened. <laughs> you know, you're not going to say, well, that, that was a trick of the hand, you know. It, something powerful has happened. How did it happen? They have two choices. Either this was God, or in their worldview, it, it certainly wasn't. A, couldn't do it by the power of man. It was either God, or it's satanic. Especially with these people making claims about Jesus, that he must be the Messiah. And they look at the evidence, they hear the report, and they say, it's only by the prince of demons who he does these things. That's the, that's the account. What does Jesus draw out of that? They've immediately called uh, the power that Jesus uses, the power of Beelzebub, prince of demons. Jesus gives him the name he uses, that's Satan. Um, we won't explore all the background to that name, but Jesus, let me, let's focus about Satan. But we need to be careful here, because uh, this morning is not about the works of Satan, it's about the kingdom of God. And what people talk about, you, you discover their passion. I was only saying to Fiona yesterday, we were out just for a bit of fresh air yesterday, and she talks, she talks about you, actually. <laughs> she talks about people, she talks about the conversations that she's had. And I think, okay, okay. Because <laughs> that's her, yeah, there's other people like that, yes. <laughs> and that's her passion, that's what she loves. Other people, it's football. You only get in a conversation about football. Or a lot of people I work with, it's holidays. It's all about the holiday you've had and you're saving up for the holiday you have. What Jesus talks about primarily is the kingdom of God. That's why he uses all these different figures of speech. The kingdom of God is like this and it's like that. Just to, just to get the fullness of the picture. But he does mention here Satan. And here, the kingdom of God has challenged the kingdom of Satan. And Satan is the adversary. Uh, Beelzebub can mean the lord of habitation, the one who's taking ownership. Uh, certainly called prince there, ruler. Prince of the air, which is an interesting title in our day and age where communication is so much over the airwaves. Mm. And how information is disseminated and facts are received. But Jesus has challenged the, the kingdom of Satan. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, because he knows their thoughts, he not only hears their words, he knows what's behind the words. He knows their thoughts. And he's so clever in the way he, he, he deals with people, because he doesn't chuck, no way, what on earth is it? He said, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> and gets behind the defences. And tells this story, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And the logic is, if Satan is working against himself in releasing people from affliction, then he's defeating his own objectives. And it will come to an end. That's, that's a ridiculous statement. 
I'm trying to find a parallel. I hope this, this helps. Um, the, the, the Samaritans are in the news uh, this week because they're taking sponsorship from a, a big betting company. People are saying, oh, actually, you know, we're trying to sort out people's problems and you're receiving money from them. But it is, it is I think it's a helpful illustration, the addictive gambler. I know there's more in gambling than just getting money. But certainly, one of the aims is that you'll win the jackpot, you'll get the big prize. So you take the money you have and you put it into this machine or you place it on this bed and you lose it. But you'd hope to get more, so you try again. But you've lost that. And those who, Gamblers Anonymous, that's, that's the self-destruction that's in it. The very means that you're trying, that you're using to gain, is actually bringing your destruction. It's what Jesus is saying here. If Satan is using his power against his works, it won't stand. Anyway, he says, your people, they cast out demons, how do they do it? <laughs> is that, they couldn't say that's of demons? But then he makes the profound statement, but if, now you've got to decide, if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. If I, by a supernatural power, can release people from what he says is demonic, satanic hold. And um, it's interesting, in, in Luke 13, the, the woman who was uh, bent double for 18 years, um, and Jesus says to her, woman, you're set free from your infirmity. But they were indignant because Jesus did it on the Sabbath. And Jesus, uh, his reply, you hypocrites, hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey lead it out to water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, and then he specifically says, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free. And he's saying, by the Spirit of God, I can counter what the, the enemy has done and bring release. And he doesn't claim it by himself. That's the interesting thing about Jesus. It's, he's doing the Father's work. He is the Son of God, but he says it's by the Spirit of God. And he, he isn't out for making a name for himself. Look at me. Look what I can do. He said, actually, I'm dependent on the Spirit of God to do this. But if, it, if by the Spirit of God I do this, then, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Here is the light piercing the darkness. Here is the liberty that the prophets foretold. Here is hope where people were absolutely hopeless. The, the woman with the issue of blood who spent all her savings that nobody could cure her by a touch of his garment, he's, she's healed. The man who'd been 40 years by the pool. And Jesus comes. And all the, all the hopes, the desires, the longings are met in this man. It's an interesting phrase that Jesus uses there when he says the kingdom of God has come upon you. Translating it into a bit easier phrases, it means the kingdom of God has overtaken you. The kingdom of God has taken you unawares. The, the kingdom of God um, has surprised you. You weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> and then... It's the, so I, and, and, uh, when I do watch athletics on television, I like the long races, the 5,000 meter, the 10,000 meter, because you, you've got to, if you're in it, you've got to work out your strategy. And some people run from the front, but they often don't win, some do. But you, 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 you tuck yourself in the back, and then coming round the last bend of the home straight, you burst forward. And it's, it's the front runner who's been going there, thinking, I'm going to win. And then this person comes up on your shoulder and overtakes you. Think, where did they come from? It's, come on, we've got to mention it, it's the Ben Stokes. Yes. Yay. Where do all the commentators are saying, England are out. And then this man goes, where did that come from? How did he do that with the Australians? We weren't expecting that. And the people are lost for words. You see, 
Jesus says, I've done this. Here is a demonstration of the kingdom of God. You're seeing it for yourself. You're a witness of the kingdom that I represent. Let me go on to the wider teaching. You see, let me build on that. The kingdom of God has come upon you. One of the things we want to emphasize in this series of the kingdom of God, and um, uh, you know, I'm not using the preacher's prerogative to get at people. I'm making a general statement, but if the hat fits, wear it. The kingdom of God is not about you. <laughs> okay? It's not about me and how I'm experiencing life and how I feel about God and if things going well or bad. The kingdom of God is not about us. The world is not spinning around me. I'm not the centre of it all. The kingdom of God is the eternal, the kingdom that never had a beginning and will never have an end. It's the everlasting kingdom. And somewhere in that I fit in. But the kingdom is so much bigger. And it doesn't exist or operate because I believe in it. Oh, the kingdom must be here because you know, I'm trusting God. The kingdom of God is. And if you don't believe it, it still is. It's like people say, I don't believe in God. Is that not God being? Of course not. God is. I am. That's his name. The kingdom of God is not given any credibility by my experience. How I experience Christian faith and God in my life does not define how the kingdom is. That's very important. So when Jesus says the kingdom has come, he doesn't mean, well, it's just arrived. <laughs> you know, it hasn't been there before. Oh, God has a new plan. Let's send the kingdom down to earth. The kingdom has come. Not at all. When he says the kingdom has come, what he is saying is, now you're experiencing it. That's right. What has always been, now you're tasting of it. You see, his kingdom has brought the whole of creation into being. The whole of our history of this planet, of the nations, has been guided by his hand. His kingdom encompasses everything that is. It's like it says in Genesis, in Genesis 1. He made the stars also. He did all that and he made the stars. As well as knowing us when we were unformed in our mother's womb. That's the extent of the kingdom. But the kingdom has come, in this sense, because it is focused. It's like the magnifying glass taking the sun's rays and then it's intense heat. It's come in the person of Jesus. So him standing there in that situation, he can say, I am the kingdom. This is what the kingdom is. So it's not about me, it is everything about him. Now there have been many models of kingship in the biblical history. And, uh, we won't trace the whole of it. But the Israelites, um, they had God as their king. He was their ruler, he was their provider, he looked after them, he protected them, everything. And then they said, we want to be like other nations and have our own king. And he said, are you sure? Because they would impose taxes and they'll take you to war and all sorts of stuff. But uh, then we've got the story of uh, David and, and Solomon. And so there were examples of kings in the land. And then we go through the whole uh, Old Testament, and there's good kings and there's bad kings. Some were very good, some were awful. They did evil. But then we come to the person of Jesus who says the kingdom has come because the king is here. I love it in the Nativity story, when the wise men come to look for Jesus, they say... Where is he who is born king? Not what he will become king. In, in that moment of birth, he is the king. And we come to the end of his life on earth, and he's been before Pilate, and Pilate says, are you a king? And I love the way Pilate says to him, is that your own idea? Are you clever enough to think that out? Or did somebody have to tell you that? <laughs> and he said, well, 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 my kingdom is not this world. He said, but the light in saying I'm the king, and for this reason I was born to testify to the truth. You're right in saying I am the king. And so when he's on the cross, they have the, the plaque, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. They want to change it for Pilate. He says, what I've written, I've written. He is 
in himself a king. But because he's left the earth, doesn't mean to say the kingdom has gone. The same spirit that was upon Jesus in this account here, Jesus says, when I go, I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to give you exactly the same spirit. And his kingdom, will, his rule, his reign will operate through you, and is now given to the disciples. Let me just summarize what I've said there. When we're talking about the kingdom, we'll be talking about Jesus. Because creation was, belongs to him. It's him who holds the whole of creation together. It was by his word that creation came into being. We can't have anything without Jesus. If he's exercising judgment, if he's making pronouncements as here in, in uh, Matthew 12, then he says that his word is like a sharp two-edged sword that actually gets to the heart of issues. He talked about um, the God who holds all things together. The God whose word, his instruction, Jesus is the word of God. So what I'm saying is, everything about the kingdom is, is about Jesus. The authority that he holds is a, an authority over every other authority. So the Pharisees come, they've got the authority to come from Jerusalem, but actually what he says overrides what they think. So on a religious ground, he has the authority. And he makes lots of pronouncements about the, the temple and the city. Um, because they've rejected him, the word of God, then destruction is going to come. Jesus has authority in, in religious matters, in, in governments, in nations. When Jesus is before Pilate, he says, you would have no authority over me unless it was given you from above. And so when Jesus says the, the kingdom has come, he, in himself, he's totally secure in any religious or political environment because uh, what he said, nobody's going to take their life, my life from me. I'm in charge. I choose when to lay it down. And he, he has this um, inner... Uh, um, I can't think of the word. In himself, he's, he's got the authority. Because... In, in, inherent. inherent. Thank you very much. In, because he's been sent uh, by God. But also, there's delegation. He does want us to be involved in the, the kingdom. Verse 30 says, uh, He who is not with me is against me, does not gather with me, scatters. And there's the invitation to be involved with him. When Jesus says to the disciples, It's your Father's delight to give you the kingdom. I want you to be a co-worker, a partner with me. Go and make disciples in, in my name. Let me make just a few more points. How we do? So there is another kingdom. There is another kingdom. And Jesus talks about it as a strong man. And you might read this and, and say, oh, you know, it's the church to use strong arm tactics. We'll frog march people to church, you know, we'll be, we'll be the strong one. We'll bind them, we'll make them do this. Which, in some faith, they do believe. At the point of a gun, or the point of death, you will convert. You will be baptized, whatever. But Jesus, um, I haven't got time to go into it all now, but except a, a lot of you will know already, but for some it might be new teaching. The, the New Testament clearly teaches us that the, the world, that life outside of God, lies in the grip of the evil one. He's called the prince of this world. And he's caused havoc. And he's the strong man in verse 29. But Jesus says, a stronger person needs to come in and tie him up and take his possessions. See, the kingdom of God is taking back what rightly belongs to him. It was uh, Reinhard Bonker who says that in his mission, and he uh, conducted loads of missions in Africa, was tens of thousands of people attended those, and he, what he said was that we're robbing hell to populate heaven. I'm reading uh, a book by Max Hastings on the uh, year 1914 and the, uh, the German offence against the French and the Russian. 
and the Germans are coming against Paris. And uh, Lloyd George talks to one of the French generals because Paris, Paris is under danger of being captured. And Lloyd George says to the, to the general, you know, I, are you going to evict the Germans from France? And he stands there and says, it is necessary. And Jesus in his kingdom says, it is necessary to take back what belongs to God. An enemy has done this. And in Luke's Gospel, he says, I can do it by the finger of God. And one commentator has says that Jesus is conscious that he is the agent of irresistible power. And this is the kingdom that we operate in. And he says the, the strong man has been bound. So this isn't the, you know, when we're praying, I bind you in Jesus' name, blah, 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 blah. It, it says, actually, I've restricted, I've, I've uh, withheld the authority and the power of Satan. It is the picture of a burglar going in and tying up the people and taking all the possessions from their house, which is a shocking picture to think of Jesus doing that, but he loves to use shocking pictures. So we get the point. And, and the tied up person is helpless. You're just taking all my goods. Oh, you just sit there and be quiet. Don't move. I'm just going to take it. And Jesus is coming into Satan's kingdom and rescuing people. But the Bible talks about taking, clutching, burning brands from the fire. Because then Satan's kingdom has no authority where Jesus operates. So the kingdom has come, and it is coming. Every one of us here who are, who are Christians have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. The kingdom of God has come to you. And it is still coming. And one day will come when Satan will not only be bound, but he will be destroyed. And then the new age will come. There will be the resurrection, uh, there will be the final judgment, then there will be the new creation. So the kingdom has come. It is coming. And it will come. And over this series, we're going to be looking at how that works. Last three points. So what is God doing? He's rescuing people now. The church is the demonstration of God's kingdom. The church is not the kingdom, but the church reflects to the world what the kingdom of God is. And we're going to be describing the kingdom as we go through the series. It's a celebration. No wonder that the dumb speak, the, the blind see. Isaiah 35, the, the, the tongue of the dumb shall shout for joy, the lame shall leap like a deer. Mike talked about the joy of the redeemed. The kingdom of God is a celebration because we've been set free. Hallelujah. Set free. Sin shall no more have dominion over you. Hallelujah. That's the kingdom. The kingdom is mercy. And God doesn't deal with us according to our sins. See, David, who was being chased by Saul, David could have killed Saul because Saul went into the cave to relieve himself. And David crept up behind him and they could have killed him. But he just cut off a corner of his cloak and said, that's how I've treated you. That's mercy. And the kingdom of God is mercy. It's authority. We talked recently about spiritual warfare. And here is Jesus. No, no histrionics, no uh, incredible hoo has Jesus healed him. Stretch out your hand. Whatever it is. But he knows the authority he inherently has. The church is, is growth. I will build my church. So the question is, the church is going to die? The church can never die. I will build my church, and what's it say? The gates of death shall not prevail against it, because the church belongs to Jesus. It's his body on earth. They tried to kill him once, and they didn't succeed. They won't succeed the second time. Hallelujah. And this robbing his possessions. Let me just give you the... These are the little nipples. Okay? These are the little tasters. The kingdom of God will restore this earth. Romans talks about the whole of creation groaning, waiting for the liberation, for the revelation of the sons of God. Because then, when Jesus comes again, creation will know it's released from 
death and dis decay. And God will make a whole new world, a whole new creation. There's a lovely verse in Revelation which says that the kingdom of God, there's going to be trees by this, this river. And the leaves will be for the healing of the nations. How much do we want the healing of the nations? So people can live together in harmony and peace. And the kingdom of God, it's inconceivable, isn't it? No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared. But where nations will live together under one king, and there will be healing of the nations. It will be bringing history to its conclusion, where it was all meant to go. And we've often mentioned it in Colossians, that the purposes of God, the mystery that was hidden from people for ages, but now revealed in Jesus when he comes and says the kingdom of God is amongst you, the purpose of God is to unite all things in heaven and on earth under one head, even Jesus Christ. And there will be a universe again. And the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And Paul says, we have tasted, now, as we're experiencing the kingdom of God, we have tasted of the powers of the coming age. This is the kingdom we're in. Which, when we think about it, blows our minds. But we're invited to be part of it. We're invited to come into it. We're invited to be participating. In we're invited to pray your kingdom come. We're invited to be part of the answer, not being part of the problem. So we want to pray. Let's say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.